In the late 70s, a series of murders would leave the women of Los Angeles afraid to walk the streets. All heck broke loose. All women were high risk. It was such a scary time. Whomever had done this was certainly no amateur. Crimes that plumbed the depths of depravity. They put a bare wire in each of her palms and then plugged it in and out of the wall and they tried to electrocute her. A killing spree that broke all the rules. Most serial sexual murder cases, these are done solo. Same individuals are out there and they're getting away with murder. And baffled the experts. And there was the sweet guy. Hey, Dean, how are you doing? And then there was the sadistic murderer. You know, I told you, killing a broad doesn't make any difference to me. Not all Hollywood stories have a fairy tale ending. Welcome to Los Angeles. say Hollywood, there's a perception out there that's this glamorous place where all the movies are made and, and, the, and the stars live. Well, that, that's really not true. Uh, there's seedy areas of Hollywood. Nothing's changed. Just the, just the faces, but the same, same type of action's going on right now. It's been that way forever. In 1977, Hollywood's dark underbelly would be exposed to the world. It was the time of disco and night clubbing, and uh, while women were sexually liberated, they still were not viewed as um, full-fledged citizens in many ways. And prostitutes were still viewed as whores and not as victims. In the late 70s, Lois Lee founded Children of the Night, a charity dedicated to rescuing children from prostitution. Who knows what they're going to be when they grow up? Raise your hand. I want to be a social worker. A social worker. Do you want to work with kids? Kids like yourself? The most common age was 19, and that was true on the streets of Hollywood. It just seems to draw a lot of transient type people to it. Young people that either run away from home, uh, no matter where, from the Midwest, the East Coast, wherever, and they end up on the streets selling their body for a place to sleep. One such teenager working the Hollywood streets was Yolanda Washington, prostituting to support herself and her baby son. Her friends had called me and asked me to help her when she was in a Beverly Hills courtroom. She seemed to be like a nice girl who was trapped in prostitution. By the time I got to the courtroom, she had already pled guilty and was going to jail for 10 days and was supposed to call me when she got out of jail. She never did. On the 17th of October, 1977, Yolanda Washington's whereabouts were discovered. Her friends called and said she was dead, found nude on a hillside. At the side of the road, near Hollywood's famous Cemetery to the Stars, Yolanda lay naked and dead. And her murder would be just the first of many. It was just before six in the morning. The call basically was, you've got a dead body. It looks like a young female, nude. Uh, Any time it involves a young person, uh, they, those, those are tough. Those are always tough. See where this car is? She was right, right there. Uh, she was found up here in uh, this ice plant bedding type material. She was uh, nude, uh, face up. Feet were pointed down 
uh, towards that direction of the cul-de-sac. As soon as arriving at the scene and taking a look at the body, there, there's no doubt it was a murder because you could see ligature marks on her wrists, you could see them on her ankles, and you could see them on her neck. So it appeared she had been uh, tied up uh, and she had been strangled. We thought we had one random killing, um, not having any idea where it was going to lead to or to what it was going to lead. We had no idea that this was the beginning of a series. The body was eventually identified as 15-year-old Judy Miller. She, too, had disappeared from the streets of Hollywood. She was still at the coroner's office, her body, and we got a call uh, that there had been another murder, that a body had been found, uh, another young lady, nude, in Glendale. Uh, my partner and I went to the coroner's office. They, they, they pulled our victim out. Uh, they placed that body next to what turned out to be Lisa Caston's body. And I, and I can remember uh, the coroner who looked at the bodies were both next to each other. He said, uh, looks like they came out of a, a Xerox machine. Same kind of thin uh, ligature marks on the wrists and ankles and on the neck. Uh, and the, they were left the same on a hillside beside a road. Uh, they did not have any clothing or jewelry or any identifying things of any kind at or near them. We knew we had a killer or killers out there that was responsible for at least two murders. And the tally was about to increase. The sun is Sunday. Uh, I believe it was November 20th, 1977. Got called out to a, a nude body found in a bush in the Highland Park area. A young girl in her early 20s, obviously deceased, uh, had ligature marks on her wrist and ligature box on her ankles and obviously uh, ligature marks around the neck. It appeared to me that she'd been strangled. The dead girl was 20-year-old art student, Christina Weckler. Her father came down to uh, Los Angeles and I met one of them and that's probably the most displeasing thing about working homicide is having to sit and talk to the mother and father of the victims. How to tell him what exactly happened to his daughter. It was a tough moment for him, very tough moment. Christina lived on her own in an old apartment complex on East Garfield Avenue in Glendale. Detectives found no obvious suspect. So I continued an investigation involving her background, who she went to school with, who she was dating, etc. A name came up in the early part of the investigation. Uh, a name by the name of Kenneth Bianchi came up. And I recall that I got that name from probably one of her notebooks. And one of the interesting comments that she made in that notebook about Kenny, Kenneth Bianchi was that he was like a used car salesman. Christina Weckler had met Kenneth Bianchi when he was a neighbor at the Garfield Avenue apartment block. It was a meeting that had cost her her life. By the 20th of November 1977, four young women had been found dumped naked on the hillsides of Los Angeles. In a notebook belonging to victim Christina Weckler, a neighbor's name was written. She had likened him to a used car salesman. Kenneth Alessio Bianchi was born on the 22nd of May 1951 in Rochester, New York, the child of a prostitute. His biological mother doesn't want him, gave him to a neighbor to take care of for a day, who gave him to another neighbor to take care of for a day, to another neighbor. Basically, for four months, there was no bonding. Ken was adopted by Francis Pacioni. 
Francis Piccioni had always wanted a child, loved Ken, adored Ken, was terrified something horrible would happen to him. He became almost a god to his mother. He, he was the, he was her life. She was terrified he was going to get sick and die, so she's constantly having him checked. This overprotective, over smothering really had to affect his ability to feel that he was a strong and powerful person. She fixated on urinary tract infections. I don't know why. I think that's very possible that in treating him and helping him and checking him, she went way too far and doesn't know it or didn't know it. A lot of people feel that early genital stimulation, whether it's through sexual abuse, whether it's through medical care, will provide a background for later over-sexualization of the child. All throughout his medical records, you see these comments about how uh, Mrs. Piccioni is a very troubled woman and needs help, and so is the child. Somebody needs to do something about this child. A lot of people had some strange opinions of him in that he didn't have any substance or truthfulness to him. Bianchi's mother told me that he, he always lied, that he, he lied from the time he was young. She said when he was like six or seven, they went to a grocery store or a supermarket and they got home and they got out of the car and stuff started falling out of Bianchi's pocket, like candy and cookies or something. And she, of course, rhetorically asked him, where'd you get that stuff? Because she hadn't paid for it. And Kenny absolutely denied he knew how it got in his pants. Most people lie every day, multiple times a day. As a matter of fact, the research has shown that 97% of the population admit to lying on a daily basis, and the researchers concluded that 3% were lying about their lying. The difference here is that Bianchi and other individuals are pathological liars. They're not telling white lies to exaggerate their importance or to get out of wrongdoing. They're lying when they don't have to lie because to them, lying is a form of control and domination. As one offender told me, why tell you the truth and you could hold it over me? I'll lie about it and hold it over you. At the time, Bianchi's name was just filed amongst hundreds of other leads to be followed up on. So far, the deaths of four young women had gone largely unnoticed in the city. All that was about to change. We call it the week that was. And I think the thing that really set it off were the two young girls. Twelve-year-old Dolores Cepeda and her 14-year-old friend Sonia Johnson had gone missing after a shopping trip to the Eagle Rock Plaza. They were found on a hillside. It was near a major thoroughfare. It was right above the, the Interstate 5 freeway, one of the biggest arteries in, in Los Angeles. Their bodies were found in a trash dump. The young kids that found them thought they were mannequins to begin with. When you become involved in that kind of crime scene, you develop a lot of hate for the perpetrators. Righteously so. Professionally, you're not supposed to do that. But we do. Three days later, a 28-year-old Scientology student and aspiring actress was found dead. Jane King's body was discovered along the freeway. Jane King was picked up in Hollywood uh, after she left a place in Hollywood, this acting kind of studio. And within a week, 18-year-old business student Lauren Wagner was found dumped on a hillside drive. When Lauren Wagner got killed, all heck broke loose. When she was discovered, there was evidence in the, the palms of her hand that something had happened. 
she had burn marks in each of her palms. They didn't know exactly how those were caused, but it, it had some appearance of some kind of torture. The media dubbed the mystery killer the Hillside Strangler. The case terrified Los Angeles. The people in the city became really, really uptight and scared. People were buying guns, people were taking all kinds of lessons in karate. It was, it was frightening for a lot of women. When the nature of Lauren Wagner's abduction was revealed, the terror escalated. There were two witnesses who said it looked like it was a, a police detective arrest in front of the house, and that's when pe people really began to be scared because, and who can you trust? We were looking at a policeman because there was no resistance. And we believe that somebody in a position of authority was confronting these girls. When they first started, they, the people thought, well, it's mostly people involved in prostitution and stuff like that. But uh, Lauren Wagner was a girl going to college. She was within, uh, in the block of where she lived when she was abducted. And that just scared the heck out of everybody in town then, because it could be anybody. All women were high risk. It was such a scary time that the police told women that they did not have to pull over if a police officer was trying to pull them over. They could just go home or wherever they were going and call in. So there was a lot of pressure put on us to solve this case. Detectives were left wondering where and when the strangler might strike next. The pressure of a case like that is self-imposed. And then as they go on, that just multiplies because you know the same same individual or individuals are out there and they're getting away with murder. And the Hillside Strangler wasn't about to stop, committing a crime that would send shockwaves through the city. Yeah, it was really considered uh, a, a really brazen murder. Welcome to Los Angeles. This is the location where Kimberly Martin was found. The day of this incident, by the time uh, we got up here, uh, you could not walk down this street. There were so many cars and uh, so many people. They dumped her body down this big vacant hill and left her kind of spread eagle facing all of downtown Los Angeles. When I first got up here and took a look, it, it just appeared that uh, uh, the killers were playing to the media. Here is a hillside strangler victim for you. Look at me. Look how I've been able to elude you. Look at how I have been able to demonstrate the skill of my homicides. Uh, look how great I am is what happens when people are displayed. The so-called Hillside Strangler had claimed the lives of nine young women, and the killing was far from over. In the last two months of 1977, the so-called Hillside Strangler had abducted and murdered nine young women, brazenly dumping their naked bodies for all Los Angeles to see. Then as quickly as they had begun, the killings stopped. And we wondered, Jesus, you know, what happened? They move, they're in jail, in custody, they die. We, we didn't know. Um, and then all of a sudden we had the Hudspeth case. High in the Los Angeles mountains, the naked body of 20-year-old telephonist Cindy Lee Hudspeth had been placed in the trunk of her car and rolled off the side of the road.
The killing confirmed an awful suspicion that investigators held, something virtually unheard of in the annals of serial killing. If you did dump her car off, how would you get back down the mountain? You wouldn't want to walk. It'd be so conspicuous to be all these people would see you driving, and it could easily be a police car or a highway patrol car come by there and see you walking it at night. Somebody wouldn't do that. It just wouldn't make sense. So you, you pretty much know that there was a second car. The killer was not acting alone. Most serial sexual murder cases, these are done solo. These are private things because the individual's own deviancy is something that he doesn't understand. He doesn't share this with anybody. Although detectives didn't know it at the time, Cindy Hutspeth had earlier taken her car to an upholstery shop in Glendale. Owned by 44-year-old Angelo Bono. Bono's dad got divorced, so Bono grew up without a father in the home. He grew up in an area in which there were Mexican gangs. He was Italian, but he actually uh, hung out with the, some of these Mexican gangs. He had juvenile arrests, I think involving car theft or something along those lines. He was vicious to women, and that seemed to have started, at least in high school, uh, just not a nice guy. He showed a definite, uh, almost hatred of women. We know that he was very sadistic. He loved inflicting pain. It had to come from his childhood. There had to be something he witnessed or experienced or was given access to or fantasized about that he was able to put into practice as he became a, an adult. But we don't know about it. Bono married at 20, but his brutality meant it ended in divorce. Three more unsuccessful marriages followed. As an adult, he worked at times in car dealerships, probably doing some mechanic or upholstery work. At some point, he became adept at doing upholstery work, and so uh, he opened up this car shop in, uh, in Glendale, in which he did that kind of work and became known for his artistry. He's a guy that lives by the mafia code. He always thought he was a macho Italian mafia guy. The oversexed Bono slept with many of the local young girls, including his son's girlfriends. Many willing partners offered themselves to the man who'd become known as the Italian Stallion. There was nothing attractive about him physically, but his attitude his sense of, of strength, his sense of uh, this is who I am, the confidence that he had, that can be extremely attractive to people. But Bono's sexual and sadistic nature was always apparent. He, along with several other people, including his sons, would go to Hollywood and flash badges on prostitutes, pretend to arrest them, and get a big laugh out of it. At the time, Angelo Bono was not a suspect for the police. In fact, 10 women were dead, and they still had no clear leads. Obviously, you don't want to see anybody else hurt. And as it goes on longer, you want to, you know, you really want to get this individual or individuals off the street. But there, there's something that'll pop up in your head that'll say, give us one more chance, you know, uh, which is a, a sort of a comber bad thing to think that somebody else has to die to solve this but but yeah I, I i think anybody that's been involved in a series that goes on as long as this would be lying to say that that thought didn't cross their mind but the next bodies would appear not in the hills of los angeles but 1200 miles north in the quiet bayside community of Bellingham, Washington. A double murder of students Karen Mandig and Diane Wilder. They were roommates, they were both schoolmates at Western Washington University. The two friends had been missing for a day 
when Karen's car was spotted parked on a hillside. We approached the vehicle and uh, could see the two bodies in the uh, hatchback of the vehicle. They had been ligature strangulation victims, and it was very cleanly done, in the, and uh, it looked as though whomever had done this um, was certainly no amateur. These two girls had been in contact with a security patrol captain named uh, Kenneth Bianchi, who worked for Wacom Security. We got a magic phone call. Bellingham, Washington. We got a guy in custody up here. His name is Kenneth Bianchi. There's lots of things you're telling me that I don't really mesh with the total picture that we've accumulated so far. I want you to understand something, okay? Just between you, between you and me and, and everybody else. And <laughs> I'm not a doctor. I don't know why. Why the heck I haven't remembered things all this, you know, all this time. The security guard's driving license revealed former addresses in Los Angeles. We knew that he had come from that area during the time the Hillside Stranglings had been active in Los Angeles, and they had ceased around the time he came to Bellingham. He had uh, an address in Glendale on Garfield, which was next door to Christina Weckler, right across the street from Cindy Hudspeth's address. And uh, we'd never had that connection before. At that time, there was no doubt in our mind. We had a, a, a viable suspect. However, those that knew Kenneth Bianchi were certain an innocent man was in custody. My first recollection of hearing about it was when uh, Ken had been arrested and in discussing it with uh, fellow workers, no one really believed that it was true. I found him very charming. It doesn't bother you if I smoke, does it? Can I have a cigarette, please? He was a nice person. Oh, thank you, John. That's service. Thank you. Mm. And it was just a shock and no one really believed that it could be true, that they would figure out in a couple of days that they had the wrong guy. <laughs> but was it possible that both the wrong guy and the right guy inhabited the same body? Something extraordinary was about to happen. What is your name? Billy. All right, Billy. Apparently hypnotized, Bianchi began to bring forth several completely separate identities. Anybody else here to talk to? My friend. Who's that? Stevie. He's my second best buddy. There was Kenny. There was the sweet guy, the, the caring guy. You see there, Ken? A game we used to play when I, when I was a kid called London Bridges. You know, you know where everybody, where, where people stand with their arms crossed and somebody goes down. Yeah. Down the middle, it looks like that. And then there was the sadistic murderer. It's too broad, getting it on. Back in those days, if you could fake your way through an insanity defense, you could walk. I'm really desperate. I think I'm losing my head, you know. I. I you know, I told you, killing a broad doesn't make any difference to me. Why do you want killing to kill any doesn't yeah, make well, any difference. Maybe you didn't kill any of those. I don't know. Oh, hey, no, wrong, man. Hey, I killed a couple of these. Billy, tell me, what do you know about Ken? Ken? I don't know, Ken. And how about Steve? He's a bad egg. Several doctors became convinced that Kenneth Bianchi was a multiple personality and that he had been completely unaware that his alter ego, Steve, was a murderer. This captain is the broad you killed, you say. Am I going too fast? Yeah, you're going too damn fast. I'm, I'm not that smart. Detectives, however, were far less easily swayed. It was apparent to me that it was a case of some really bad acting. Open your eyes and look at Mr. Brad. He wants to talk to you. Hey, Dean. How you doing? He was a typical 
used car salesman. Okay. Do you want to get the baby yet? It's ironic that thinking back that Christina Wecker made that little note in her book. And she was right. We brought in our own uh, expert in um, multiple personalities who conducted a series of interviews with Bianchi and came to the conclusion that Bianchi was definitely faking being a multiple personality. Bianchi immediately changed his plea, knowing that he'd been caught from not guilty to let's make a deal. And then all of a sudden he pops up with the name Bono, spills his guts. Kenneth Bianchi claimed that he had committed all the Hillside Strangler murders with a partner. 44-year-old Glendale car upholsterer, Angelo Bono. And there was a shocking twist. Bono and Bianchi were cousins. In 1979, after being caught for a double murder in Washington State, Kenneth Bianchi had revealed that he had committed the infamous Hillside Strangler murders with another man, Los Angeles car upholsterer Angelo Bono. Bono's dad was the uh, brother of Bianchi's adopted mother. So Bono and Bianchi were cousins. In return for avoiding the death sentence, Bianchi offered to tell the full shocking story of his and Bono's crimes and testify against his accomplice. Bianchi grew up in Rochester, which at that time was not really an engaging place. And uh, uh, he came to LA because his mother asked Angelo if he, he might come out here and look for a job. He comes to Hollywood, and he can hardly wait. I've always wanted to uh, go to California, the sun, the girls, the beaches. When they got together, uh, it was a very evil moment. There are really only a handful of cases where there's more than one offender. And when there is more than one offender, there's almost always a dominant individual and one assistant that's brought along. In the Hillside Strangling case, it seems that Buono was the dominant person in terms of uh, sadism and so on, but Bianchi wasn't far behind. He met his sexual predator uh, cousin, Bono, who he admired initially. He looked up to this guy. He thought he was the, wow, look at the way this guy handles woman. Bono treated women like they were a, a dirt possession, a, a possession that you use. Soon after arriving in Los Angeles, Kenneth Bianchi attempted to get a job with the police force. I like to work with people, and I like doing things for people. And I can't think of any job where you become more in contact with people in the law enforcement field. And that's what I want the most out of life, is I want Something I'm going to be happy in, something that I, I'll be satisfied in, something I can make a career out of. I think it's if I keep it. Rejected by two police departments, Bianchi instead decided to embark on an alternative career with his cousin. They had two 16-year-old uh, girls that Bianchi brought to Bono. And they eventually used these two girls as the, the, the core of an out-call prostitution service. These guys were horrible. They terrified these girls. They did take them out to a warehouse to have sex with a group of men that they told were the police. Whether they were or they were not, I don't know. Um, when one of the girls ran away, they took a cat and they killed a cat and sent it to her in a box and wrote on it that you're a dead pussy. Um, they were bad guys. When both girls eventually fled the city, the hillside stranglings began with the murder and dumping of prostitute Yolanda Washington. 
Bianchi explained to law enforcement how the crimes had been committed at Bono's house. His house was an old house right next to a car wash. Behind his house was a large former garage that was now his upholstery shop. They took all but Yolanda Washington to that house. They would uh, place them in a certain chair. They would eventually strip them of all their clothing. Um, whatever one, and not all the time, both of them, would sexually assault the victim. And then they would strangle them with a ligature. Took everything on the body of any identification, clothing, or anything, put it in a trash bag, and then just put it in a, uh, a dumpster nearby. They would then haul the body out into the car area in front of the shop and put the body in the trunk. And then they'd drive the car. In each case, they drove to a different area and dumped the body. Using fake police badges and ID, the two cousins would prowl Hollywood looking for victims. Bianchi's description of their abduction of aspiring actress Jane King offers a chilling insight into their ruthlessness. There's the usual um, cruising around Hollywood. Uh, both of us at the same time spotted her at the bus stop. Angel said, you see what I see? When Angel smiled at me and I knew he appeared, he, he definitely wanted to take her to his house. Angel had his handcuffs and his ID on him, and I had ID on me. The ID wasn't used, but when we got to Angelo's house, he stopped in the driveway, and he grabbed her one arm, and I saw him do that, and I grabbed her other arm. And she said, what's going on? What are you doing? She's getting scared, and she, she said, oh, let me go, don't hurt me. Um, very, very scared. Jane King would be found dumped at the side of a road, just yards from a busy golf course. Bianchi not only admitted rape and murder, but also torture. The Weckler girl uh, had been uh, injected uh, with Windex, and also they had attempted to uh, gas her with natural gas. And he provided the explanation for the marks found on Lauren Wagner's hands. They put a bare wire in each of her palms and taped uh, that around uh, to her hand and then plugged it in and out of the wall and essentially tried to elect electrocute her. Together, the Hillside Stranglers had taken the lives of 10 women. But just who was the driving force behind these killing cousins? Usually, there is a leader. There's a very strong individual. And then there is someone who is extremely psychologically passive, who will do whatever the other person wants. Is it hero worship? Uh, is it a sense of, I will do what you want because I admire you so much? I've been asked the question before, who was the dominant one, who was the leader, who was the follower? Um, all I can say is Bianchi was, he was the talker. He was the front guy. Uh, he was the salesman. He could sell the job. He could sell what was going on on the street because so many of the girls were taken off in a prostitution type situation or a police stop. So without a doubt, he would, he would be that person. Uh, I, I've got no doubt about that. Uh, Bono being the quiet individual, the stronger one. Uh, I, I know in one case where Bono said no. The incident would be a terrifying near miss for the daughter of a Hollywood legend. This is the, the actual corner where they tried to take off uh, Peter Laurie's daughter, it's right there. Catherine Laurie's father, Peter, was a star from Hollywood's golden age. Not realizing who she was, the Stranglers, posing as police officers, began an abduction attempt until the moment she showed them her ID. Bono recognized who they had, 
And I, I can only conjecture what his thinking was, is this is really going to draw attention if she disappears and she's murdered. Um, Peter Lorre's daughter, Hollywood, blah, blah, blah. So he, according to Bianchi, nixed that. So um, shows me a little bit where he called the shots as far as yes or no, or gave the final okay. So what had brought Kenneth Bianchi and Angelo Bono to rape, torture, and murder a dozen unsuspecting young women? Were they simply born killers? I'm not sure they're two of a kind because they're not alike. And they had different roles in all of this, but, but they're, they were uh, together, they were really scary. First off, you've got the, the uh, sociopath with Angelo. Bono was a rotten SOB. He was simply not a nice guy. Bono was just a, a sexual pervert uh, with sadistic uh, tendencies who let them go beyond any bounds at all. Sexual sadism is an arousal pattern that's deviant. Most rapists rape when they're in a re committed relationship with a wife or girlfriend. It's, it's not that they can't have sex, it's that the control and domination is all part of what's arousing sexually. Um, and this is certainly the case with Bono. Bianchi, I just, I really think that it would be, it'd be his urge to kill probably uh, predominates on him. And it would be very hard for him to live without having that dark urge. You start with a kid who has no bonding. And that's a huge issue. And that's external, that's not internal. If a killer was formed or if an individual who could act without the same conscience that we have. I think that's where it occurred. With Bianchi, there appears to have been that sense of I have to kill. He killed a lot of people in a very short period of time and killed them and with his compatriot's help in vicious, vicious ways and didn't even stop when he moved his geography. So we stand with the fact that he was the individual who appears to have been born to kill. I think there's a good chance Bianchi would have killed if he would not have even met, met up with Bono. I, I just think that's his personality. Um, Bono, you know, was like 20 years older than Bianchi. And to our knowledge, um, and I could probably say without a doubt, had not killed before. You know, I mean, he'd, he'd been a criminal. He'd committed various crimes, but he had not killed. Um, so, you know, conjecture would be that maybe he never would have if, if Bianchi would not have drifted out here and, and teamed up with him. Bianchi's testimony, backed up by meticulous police work, led to the conviction of Angelo Bono on nine counts of murder. Both cousins would escape the death penalty, but both would be locked up for life. Bono in California, Bianchi in Walla Walla, Washington. The unfortunate thing you have to do in a lot of murder cases, you have to make a deal with one dirt bag for another dirt bag. That's, that's, that's something that I have to live with all my life. If I could drive up the Walla Walla right now I'd, and get away, I'd shoot that son of a bitch. There's a very shady crowd that hangs out in Hollywood. I'm born and raised here in Los Angeles. Uh, nothing's changed. It hasn't changed since the Hillside Strangler case. It's still the same. Um, it doesn't appear it's ever going to change. We investigate the notorious Santa Cruz murderer Herbert William Mullins as Brand New Born to Kill continues next Tuesday night here on Channel 5.